gotta run. This is Will Sanchez. Tonight's guest is a very special guest. His name is Lou Pulafito. He's a runner and he's an activist. I had the honor of meeting Lou while we were both working with the Census 2010. Please welcome Lou Bolifito. Thanks for having me, Will, tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Lou, I'd like to get started by having you share with us a little bit about your background. For example, where were you born and what school did you go to? Well, I'm a native New Yorker. I was born in New York Hospital uh, many years ago, and I grew up on the Upper East Side. And basically, I went to schools in the neighborhood. And for college, I went to LaGuardia Community College. So basically, and it was all a, a Catholic education through St. Monica's, St. Agnes High School, and so on. Were you athletically inclined in your, in your high school days? In, with, in St. Agnes, I was a runner, long distance and uh, cross country, I should say, and uh, sprinting. I loved, loved the uh, 220, the 440, and so on. And the, uh, doing cross country in uh, Van Cortlandt Park. Oh, that's a great place to run. Yeah, it is. It is. Now I, uh, I run on the, uh, on the drive, try to do five miles a day. Uh, the drive, you mean the FDR drive? FDR drive, yes. That's so uh, in the morning, you could catch me running somewhere along the drive between um, 53rd Street and 125th. Some people are nervous about doing that run because of the traffic. It doesn't bother you. Well, m most of it is on, on the drive, so there's really, you're not there's a walk, there's the FDR. So there's, you're not really running in traffic, but you do kind of like smell the traffic, I would say, in certain spots. But it's a nice run. You know, my, it's one of my wife's favorites. Uh, she used to go at nighttime with her friend, and she would come back after running seven miles, and it seemed like in like no time. So, uh, so I'm just pulling your leg about <laughs> <laughs> the traffic, because yeah. it, is, it is a favorite. What about Central Park? Have you ever done anything there? I run on the weekends with my buddy uh, Brendan, and we do do Central Park, and we try to do the drive during the week. The reason why uh, we favor the drive, because it's closer to home, versus doing Central Park, which is a little bit further away. Okay. So if I have to collapse, I don't have to crawl as far. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure, as you know, you, with practice, you get better at it. <laughs> Crawling. Uh, <laughs> um, but what does running do for you? You know, why is it, uh, are you doing it for health benefits? Uh, you know, what's, what drives you? What gets you, yeah, like you said, you have, to, you have to get up early to, to, to go out there. It's that having a buddy, uh, waiting for you help? That does help because you're committed because you know there's somebody waiting for you. So no matter how you feel, you want to get out and run. And basically I did run because of the health benefits to running. Like any exercise is really healthy for you, but to me since I did it in the past, I said let me pick it up again. And it's great. It, what it does is it keeps my weight in check. Uh, also the cholesterol, all the blood chemistries are lower. It's amazing what they do say is true. Diet and exercise and no pills. Because at one time I was taking drugs for my cholesterol, but running has eliminated that. And, and diet, and of diet, course. Yeah. It's, it's a combination of things. So you picked it up. So that means when after you left college, you weren't as uh, athletically inclined when you went into the business world. We'll, we'll go into that, what, what happened yeah. after college. Well, after college, uh, my first job was at Merrill Lynch. And then uh, at the time it was called, uh, after Merrill Lynch was Pete Marwick. And then I spent most of my uh, corporate career at uh, New York Life. I was in the IT department, I was a manager okay. in the ID department. Okay. Uh, in New York Life I started running because uh, they did have a gym facility in the, uh, in the basement. So it was great that at the end of the day I would go down to the gym, work out for a half hour, and then actually run home. I would run down to Houston Okay. Turn around and run back the Upper East Side to put in my five miles. Oh, that's excellent. So you always lived on the Upper East Side? Yeah, yeah. One of my future guests is going to be uh, the Olympian Jeff Galloway. And he has studied runners over the years. And, uh, and he, with working with doctors, have estimated that for every one hour of running, you gain two hours of life. That's, that's interesting. A, that's a huge, huge benefit. So I, I encourage you and of course all our audience to run. Recently I met you in an interesting way. We were both working at that time with the Census 2010. 
and uh, I was at the lowest common denominator, and you were a field uh, supervisor. Right. It was doing fingerprinting training. Uh, so, <laughs> and yeah. you were great. Lou, tell us about how did you get involved? In, why did you get involved in the census, and what was your experience like? I got involved with the census uh, because uh, I felt like a good thing to do. At that time, I wasn't really doing anything. I wasn't working with New York Life anymore. And I said, well, let me, let me try out. I, my first experience was address canvassing. This is in what year? That was in 2009. Uh, that was to verify, to make sure that all the addresses that the census had were correct. So when the mailings went out, they went out correctly. Well, that's very interesting. Why didn't they use the postal service for, for that? Well, I think there was other things involved with that that are above us, more political, I would think, than anything else. Okay. But well, I, I can't go there. I can't comment on it. You can't comment. Well, you know, I, I think part of the reason is the census tries to be self-contained is so that it protects the privacy of everyone and rather than sharing information. So they have that firewall between the census and the other government agencies. How did you like working with the handhelds? I think the handhelds were cumbersome, but the person who was in charge, whoever designing these things, I do not saw how much experience they had in being out in the field and so on, but the handhelds um, could have been done better. That's, That's interesting. Sure. I have a different take on it. Um, you know, interestingly, I also have an IT background, mm -hmm. but I was more on the entrepreneurial side of things versus the corporate side. And my take on it, I was fascinated by the, sim the simplicity of the software. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing was make it simple that it opened it up to a lot of people able to use it without overanalyzing the thing. So, for example, uh, in the Upper East Side a couple of years ago, the SIP code 10021 changed. It was broken into three. 10065 and 10075 became, became, it came to existence right. out of 10021. And of course, the census is a long range planning tool. And when we got the, the handheld, it still had the 10021. The simplicity was you had to change each apartment unit manually for each of the for each of the zip code changes. It wasn't the case where if you change one building, all the apartments were changed. So at first I was saying, gee, that's dumb. And then I said, hmm, it, it had to accommodate the entire country. Because even though I was working in New York, houses and elsewhere not necessarily high rises. Mm -hmm. right. So I appreciated the simplicity of it. But I, I, but I wanted to hear your take on it. Well, I think that the handhelds did uh, shorten the time needed to do that because I believe what they were planning uh, for that uh, project was much shorter than uh, they thought it was. So it did, did run shorter, so the handheld did have a positive effect, but uh, from the way I look at it is it could have been done a little bit better, but it got the job done earlier. Sorry. After that, it was about another year, I, I got called in for an interview to be a, a field operations supervisor. Hey, what is that? Uh, that is they're in charge of a, a district. Um, every, well, let's say just per Manhattan, Manhattan was split into four offices. And so we're on the uh, east side office, and the east side district was sp split into 16 sub-districts. So I was in charge of one district, which encompassed, uh, well, it depends, but, but well, let's say like five square blocks. And within that, there could be several thousand of um, people who did not fill out their questionnaire. So I was one of 16 uh, FASs uh, for the local census office on the east side. And under that, and then within each district, there was subdivisions of uh, divided into eight. So there was like eight crew leaders. So um, I had to supervise eight crew leaders plus the um, enumerators. Right, and I was, uh, I was an enumerator. That's the lowest common denominator of working with the census was the enumerator. And the reason I loved it was the fact that 
uh, after meeting with my crew leaders, I hit the streets and, and I got to meet very interesting New Yorkers. Hello, ma'am. I am a census taker with the U.S. Census Bureau. Oh, terrific. Good for you. Bye. Hang on. Ask you never returned your 2010 census form, so if I could just ask you a few questions. Absolutely, dear. Will I need a calculator? No, ma'am. Because I have one. But I took the batteries out to use them in a cross massager. Oh, uh, first question, how many people live at this residence? Uh, zero. You don't live here? Oh, including me? Three. Okay, well, I'm going to put you down as the primary resident. Terrific. Now, would, how would you describe your race or ethnic origin? Well, to superior to Asians, but not as intelligent. <laughs> following describes you. Uh, white, Asian, Hispanic, Pacific Islander. Oh, Pacific Islander. <laughs> and don't skip on the wrong. <laughs> uh, what is your last name, ma'am? Blarfengar. Can you spell that for me? S-M-I. <laughs> Training was in-house, and it was no muss, no fuss, three or four days of training, and uh, the crew leader went out with you on the first or two calls to make sure you know you were on your way to, to put the right step. That's not to say there weren't issues. There were. 500,000 to 600,000 enumerators were out on the field working, and the number of problems were infinitesimal compared to that kind of number. You played an important role in that because you were at the field office, field operation, supervising the, uh, the, uh, the crew leaders. So what was your management philosophy in, 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 in getting those people to work as a team? Well, the main thing was is to um, keep morale going because, you know, uh, the census was very fluid. Things could change on, on a daily basis and also is to uh, try to get some cohesion between the office and the crew leaders down to the numerous. Make sure that the message, whatever we need to be done, was clear enough that everyone could understand it. And of course, I was, when everything came back in, we were there like when, at the gates to make sure that the information coming in was good and valid as well, besides what was checked in, in the office. And, but overall, my main job is, is to really plan. Look at how much, how many uh, questionnaires that went unfiled. And in my district, it was thousands, uh, thousands and thousands of questionnaires. And how to approach it with the number of uh, staff that we had. And I thought that we were a little lucky because in Manhattan, especially where I was on the Upper East Side, it's a high concentration of uh, high-rise buildings. So um, you get, per se, it's called more bang for your buck. You could call, walk into one building and get several hundred at one time versus um, knocking on one, one door at a time. One of the comments that I was out in the field was, 
Gee, so we got a postcard announcing that we were going to get a package to you know, keep an eye out for that. And some people thought, was that a waste of money? The idea was, as you know, it's to alert people, A, that this was coming, and B, that this wasn't junk mail, and not to toss it out. Because for everyone that went out, if we didn't have to knock on doors, which was a later operation, meant many, many thousands of dollars saved. So that mailing of the postcard, sure, cost a lot of money, but it saved a lot of money. There's a lot of opportunities to uh, save money and with the census. One of the feelings I got, and it's very well written in, in, in the newspapers, is that uh, they've been doing it for many years now, and uh, they really need a playbook to go by for each year because it really doesn't change. The uh, actual uh, work doesn't change. You might want to computerize it, but whatever, things should be standard enough from year to year. And the, uh, the other issue was, this is why, because I'm a field operations supervisor, was, is that uh, it's hard on a temporary basis to get managers in place to do that at the, uh, at the temporary level. So it's hard. So Is that the manager at your level or higher? Both, both. And without the management is that, I call myself a ringer because I was a manager in New York Life. And uh, just to quote, because we finished first, thanks to you and many other enumerators in my district, that uh, we did finish first. At one time, we were about 14th or 13th with everything. But you know, when the tough get going, we got going because there's management involved. But in other districts, and uh, even in the office, not just all, I'm not saying really all office, but stories I heard from other offices, is the management of people and what they do yeah. could, could, could have been better. But you know, that's something that could be addressed if that playbook because I got involved in the census, I did a little bit of research. And, uh, and the people at the very top were appointed by Obama when he became president. And those guys had to hit the ground running because they started like two or three years ago. And as you said, the census has been going on. And most people are fascinated to learn since George Washington. Yeah, exactly. Was it 1790 or something? 1790 is the first one. That's right. The other comment that I received was, because you know, there's always this frequently asked questions that the Census Bureau says, oh, people are gonna ask you, you know, what can I do this on the internet? Oh, you know, I don't have time, you know, can I do this tomorrow? And, and, and I had different kinds of questions. One being, why the postcard? Because people were concerned about the money. The other one was also very interesting, also concerned about the money. They received a second copy of the questionnaire. They said, you know, I submitted mine right away. Yet a week later, I received another copy in the mail. You know, isn't that a waste of, of money? I was really surprised about the responses. I mean, a lot of people uh, responded through the mailings or when we went to knock on the door. But all this was so resistant, which it was really confusing to me because the census does serve a purpose with uh, hospitals and schools and so on to do planning over for, the, for the long term and to get resistance. And especially what really bothers me a little bit is since you're on the Upper East Side, we do have people with higher income and they seem to feel that they're above this, that they shouldn't be bothered with this, which is really bothers me. You know, you hear, you should do your duty to respond and don't send your doorman or your, um, off of the uh, residential manager, whoever, to do the blocking for you. Just be open, in, unless they know something we don't, you know, it's confidential, it, it always is confidential. People are resistant, and that's what really yeah. well, upset me. Well, you think that's an, an education issue? Partly, yes, for some people, and, and other people I would think that just didn't want to be bothered. Yeah, yeah, well, New Yorkers are busy, but, this, but, this, but that's where the enumerators come. This is where, yeah. I, this is the part I love is convincing that person that this is a worthwhile yeah. thing to do. That's true, but you know what? I, I always feel, because when I was, used to work at New York Life, everybody is busy. Everybody tells you, you know what? It's not an excuse. To me, I'm busy is not an excuse. You plan it in your day somewhere. 
Oh, um, although you have to work in the real world. I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it didn't, it didn't bother me when people were, were, were resistant. Well, you know, one of the greatest pleasures I had was before we did the, the knocking on the doors, we did something called group quarters enumeration where we went to soup kitchens, we went to uh, schools, but the soup kitchens really, really affected me because the people that were standing online were so grateful that New York offered this kind of opportunity of getting food, and the people working at the soup kitchen were so kind to them, you know, offering the extra coffee, the extra muffins, uh, and you know, some of them sure didn't want to be bothered with the census, but a lot of them were very grateful to be part of the system. And it was just a matter of being human to them. And that's the part I enjoyed, making that contact. Uh, yeah, there were some New Yorkers that were rude to me. Absolutely. They just gave me the stare at yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I didn't give up. You know, sometimes you had to, you know, find your answer some other way. But anyway, let's. Uh, any final thoughts, uh, recommendations for the next 20, what is it, 2020? Uh, yeah, I think they should uh, go back and debrief, debrief everybody and to see and get it all on paper to make sure we do it uh, better next time around. All right, because somehow I think they do write it, but for 10 years it gets lost in the cabinet somewhere and they can't find it anymore. Let's talk about something. Maybe you started. Uh, before the census, and you wanted to do something with, uh, with a higher office. You wanted to run for higher office. I think you have a platform called A, a Decent Wage. Tell us about that. Okay, uh, it's, it's called Decent Life. I believe that every honest, hardworking person deserves a decent life. We all can't be CEOs. We all can't be uh, professional athletes. We can't be movie stars, but we contribute. We're honest and we're hardworking. So we should have health care, food on the table, a roof over our head, retirement, and so on. So how do we do that? And I really feel that uh, the, what we really need to do is put more money in more people's pockets. We need to uh, compress the uh, economic ranges together. So when you put more money in more people's pockets, more people have money to spend, more people can, we can afford to do, uh, increase the minimum wage and so on. Well, how, how are you going to proceed to do that? Do you have, is that a future endeavor for you to, for, for example, President Obama started as a community organizer. You as a census worker, are you <laughs> going to go to higher office? Well, what I'm trying to do is I, I have my website up uh, to uh, push the idea. Basically, it real, my ideas fall into what's called uh, sustainable development. And you see a lot of it on TV now, but they're really pushing one point, because sustainable development, it's not just sustaining the earth, it's just sustaining ourselves. So how do we sustain ourselves? In the meantime, the commercials don't cover that, you know, because we really need to uh, replace me with me. Me with we, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, we should, collaboration really needs to replace competition. Because with competition, it denotes a loser. With collaboration, yeah. everybody wins. And this thing about pushing capitalism, I, I know with time's running short, so let me just push this all in, is that we've been doing this since we've been uh, walking. It, this is dif uh, just a different form. There's always been a winner and there's always been losers. We need a different way. And sustainable development is a way to do that. And I really call it, I, I call it your love your neighbor policy. Because basically, when you love your neighbor, you're actually loving yourself. Now, how do you do that? You do that by uh, not putting your neighbor through financial hardships, all right? There's uh, only so much to go around that we need to figure out how do we take care of everybody, all right? And let me just jump back a point, because I, I am rushing, is that the problems we have today, we always had. If you go back to old movies, you see the same concepts over and over again. Like I was just watching a movie the other day, Harper, with Paul Newman, back in 1966. One of the uh, little segments there, one of the characters, was actually smuggling Mexicans 
into the country, all right, to do the farm work. Now, we're talking about 1966, mm -hmm. all right? And we're still talking about immigration today, okay? Capitalism in this form doesn't work. Sustainable development does. Loving your neighbor does. So loving your neighbor, you don't put them through financial hardship, all right? You take accountability for yourself, all right? One of the things that we can do is compress corporate compensation. Uh, it's been around for a while kicked around what the ratio should be. But basically, basically, I look at it like 20 to 1. So the lowest person in the company and the highest person can't be separated more than 20 times. So if the lowest person is making $10,000, the highest person is only making 200000 And just, just think of it. For every million dollars that you would save, you can either hire 20 more people at $50,000 or give 200 people $5,000 bonus, increase their salaries, or lower the prices for the products or services. So here you are putting more money into more people's pockets like that. And that's how you drive the economy, and that's how you get people off of public assistance. It's, it's all on my website. Folks, well, I got you dizzy. Uh, I know no, I got no, you this dizzy. Is, this is great. But I think the important thing is we need good people like Lou and others to promote these ideas and to run for higher office because we need good people in higher office to make a difference. So this is Will Sanchez saying, see you on the other side of the road. Thank you. Thanks again.